Hi, we're really excited to welcome you to a new podcast series about the Assembly Movement. If you haven't heard about the Assembly Movement yet, you can check it out on assembly.net. That's assembly with an I, not a Y in the end. The Assembly Movement is about raising a new generation of people with reckless faith, people who are open to radical new ways of serving God and working together. People who in this generation with new approaches because of their skills, their insights, and their access technology, people who are open to new ways of addressing issues in the world and glorifying God in today's world. This generation is both young and old, so it's not about a new generation rising up in terms of age, but a new generation that that comes into a new season of hope, a season of creativity and commitment to serve God together. Now, this podcast series is designed to help you work through some of the key elements in the movement, some of the things that will help you with the motivation and help you to see the possibilities and the how-to of this movement, giving you courage to step up and step into the movement with your friends. So before I introduce you to the content outline, I just want to share a little bit about myself. My name is Mark Orr. I'm a Brazilian by birth, a Canadian by citizenship. I come from a long line of uh, several generations of family members who have worked in many countries in the world in ministry. I currently live with my family in Athens, Greece. We've lived in the past in Uganda and England and Canada as a family. My motivation to this kind of reckless faith is because I believe that there is a generation of people on this planet who love God and who have the opportunity to radically change the world. We have the opportunity, but we're really not doing much about it. So I believe that we're at a place where we have more than ever before, perhaps, in the history of the world, the opportunity to work together to change the world. And yet we're doing the least about it. So there's this huge gap between opportunity and action. So let's take a minute to look at the series. We've divided it up into five sections. Each section will have roughly five episodes. The first section focuses on the world in crisis. This is looking at the current reality. And it's not just a crisis that you see in the news, but it's the crisis that is under the surface. What's really going on that holds us back from taking steps to collaboratively, collectively do something about our world? The second will turn a little bit more positive and look at what are the reasons why we believe that something that seems so impossible is actually possible. And we'll start to spell that out so that you can start to to, to nurture that little seed of hope that is growing in your heart. The third one is about the blueprint at the high level, the strategic planning behind how a movement works and what we're actually going to do about it together. The fourth uh, set of episodes will be about assembly itself. Assembly is a platform that will bring all those pieces together. Every individual will have a place in assembly, big or small, Um, someone who has a vision for their street to someone has a vision for the entire world, many different types of skills. In other words, every single person will have a simple way to engage in radical change in the world. So we're going to be looking at the specific features and functionality of assembly in that short series. And then the last is what we call an idea storm. We want to get your creative juices going. We want you to be thinking about what the issues are in your neighborhood, in your nation, and even across the world and say, you know what, I think we actually can do something about this. So we're going to run a few uh, brainstorming sessions there with you to help you get going. Most episodes will be 10 to 15 minutes long. If we have a guest, we'll add a few minutes to that. My hope is that by the time you finish with the series, a seed of hope will be growing in your heart that gives you the strength to take that first step, to take that first step of courage as a catalyst to change your neighborhood and your world. The Problem of Hope is the title that we're looking at today. This is a series that is designed to help prepare you to be part of a movement that we believe can fundamentally change the world, a movement that brings every person, every individual, who loves God and wants to be a part of change, to come together and to work in a collaborative way, in an unprecedented way that we feel hasn't happened for a long, long time. I want to focus today on hope. That's because I believe that 
hope or the lack thereof is one of the biggest problems that we face. It explains why we don't even start the journey of change and many people are simply not participating in this process. So I just want to read with you uh, a definition that I think is very helpful. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Very simple, but there's two very important words there that we'll be circling back to a number of times during the podcast. Those two words, expectation and desire, and they go hand in hand. I believe we are born with both. We're created in God's image with both a desire and an expectation for good. And yes, uh, we have sin and we have situations around us and our own selfishness over time. Those things begin to erode our hope. But I do believe that we have that seed of hope at the beginning of our lives. First, we lose expectation and then eventually we lose desire. And when we lose desire, I think we're truly hopeless. The way that that hopelessness unfolds, I see it happening in about six stages. And I think looking at these six stages helps us understand how we maybe get to a place of hopelessness, hopelessness, but also how we can intervene and start to help reverse this whole trend on a personal and a global level. Hope, I think, as I've said, is something that we're born with. We're born with this, this beautiful expectation of life um, we, we explore, and as if you've ever watched a child grow up, it's amazing to see. But then over time, uh, disappointments in life, uh, maybe the attitudes of others and things in our own lives start to creep in. And it leads to our step two, which is frustration. Frustration is not a, a loss of hope, but uh, feeling like, hey, this is hard. This is hard to maintain. This is a struggle. And many of us go in and out of times of frustration. That's normal. We're not trying to get rid of the frustration. But the frustration, if we're not careful, can lead to the next step. And the next step is one of despair, when the frustration doesn't go away. And at some point, we get to this place where um, we don't know what to do anymore. We've tried everything, and we begin to entertain the idea of hopelessness, that maybe nothing's going to change. And some of you may put despair at the very end, saying this is where you eventually arrive. I don't think it is. I think people in despair are still people who have feelings and deep down have a desire for change. And that's why they're despairing. They're despairing because they really want something. They really see something better, but they can't get it. And they don't feel they can do anything about it. And they feel powerless. So I would say despair isn't isn't the worst. Despair is a step in the process. It's not at the end. It's actually near the beginning. But if despair is not checked over time, despair leads to resignation. And that's where things get really, really sad. Resignation is when you decide, you make a mental choice. You, you, you may do that um, uh, with full awareness, or it may be just something that you come to believe over time that everything is futile, there's futility, and you accept reality around you and you stop trying. You, you basically give up. And that often happens in the mind first. And you may still go through the motions of hope and the motions that you want something different. But in reality, resignation leads to this place of uh, inaction. And that can be in the way you uh, live in your neighborhood and you just accept it the way it is, the way you live in your nation, the way you look at global issues. It can also come down to very personal things like um, your prayer life, um, your reading, uh, how and where you give your money. And uh, you just end up saying, well, I'm just going to live myself. I'm going to just take care of my family and accept the realities we live in. And so there's this resignation that is subtle and often not obvious to other people from outside, but it's a resignation in the heart. When you move to the next step beyond resignation, I call it complacency. Complacency uh, is a place where there's very little emotion. Uh, you lose the desire. So in resignation, you lose the expectation and 
that comes full circle around to losing the desire in the fifth step. That's complacency. Complacency means, you know, I'm beginning not to actually um, even think about it anymore. Um, it, I don't even notice it anymore. And uh, that's that's a tough point to go to, but I would say that can move to even one last level, and that's what I call detachment. It's this careless attitude that I, not only do I not care anymore, but I don't feel anymore. It's not my problem. The world I live in has nothing to do with me. And so there's this sense of detachment, of uh, uh, your, your responsibility um, just being given up. Those six steps, I think, guide us a bit in how to handle those. Because without hope, there is no chance that we change. If we give up hope, we give up everything. Let's remind ourselves what hope is. It's this expectation and the desire. So the desire may come first and the expectation comes second in that, yes, we want something. And actually, we expect the world to operate that way. When we give up, we give up both of those and there's not much to work with anymore. So our belief in assembly is that there's enough people at stage one, two, and even stage three, that stage of despair, that with nurturing, we can grow a community from those people, a community of hope and action. We believe that we can start to come together and strengthen the small flickering light that we already have there and start to be a, a, a light and a salt of the earth that actually spreads and starts to reclaim and reignite hope in the lives of many more people. That hope, if it's going to not be a desire, but it's going to move to an expectation, has to be accompanied with practical things, the things that help us actually start to put flesh to our belief and then help us to actually act. Because hope that is only desire um, after a time <laughs> and it doesn't go to expectation and it go doesn't go to results ends up retreating back down to a point where you lose it all again. So our, our hope is that we can spread it to the rest. Now, God is a God of grace and redemption. He can breathe life into his people. He can do that. So we truly believe not only that God can do it, but the very reason that this movement exists, the very reason that I'm sitting here today talking to you is evidence that something is happening. Something is beginning to sprout, and we believe that that will spread. Let's look at a few items here uh, from the Bible, just a couple of verses and passages that you can study later if you would like. Um, the first one I want to share is in Exodus 4.31, and it says, And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Now, what's the context here? The context is the people of Israel uh, being uh, enslaved in Egypt. Now, you remember that when they first got there, it was because Joseph had been a solution. Joseph was a highlight and God had brought Joseph through all those things that Joseph experienced. It was God's hand in his life and brought him to Egypt and set him up to be the solution to an incredible worldwide famine that was happening. And that led to uh, Joseph's family eventually coming to Egypt. And uh, Joseph and the, the, the king of that day died. And the uh, people of Israel multiplied there. But as they multiplied, they became the slaves. They became the workers and they were being mistreated. And they forgot about Joseph and they per forgot about J Jacob and they forgot about the promises. And they began to despair. They began to lose hope. And it's in that situation where God raised up a man called Moses. And there's lots more to that story we won't go into right now. But God said, I have not forgotten. And God prepared Moses with certain powers, with miracles and experiences that spoke to Moses' heart. And he, God sent Moses back to the people to give them hope. And God told Moses how to give the people hope. And when Moses talked to them and said, you know, we're not going to accept this anymore. 
we are going to leave this land and we are going to go to the promised land. God has promised us that we will be a nation and we will live in a land that is rich and beautiful. And when the people heard this, that's when they responded this way. They heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery. And I think at this point in history, we need to come back to being a people of faith, not just in our everyday survival existence, but a people of faith that believe that we are here to bring hope, to bring peace, to be compassionate, and to be active agents of change and hope in the world. We need to do that individually, and we need to do that collectively. And when I was younger, there was a lot more organizing and talking and, and, and planning and dreaming and praying about how we could work together to change the world. And I feel over the last 30 years or so, um, we have moved as a global church closer to this point of despair and resignation. I don't think that's the way it needs to be. I think God is asking us, saying, wait a minute, I haven't changed. I'm here. I need you to listen, and I want you to have hope. There's another verse I'd like to share in Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5, and it says this, Show me the right path. This is King David talking. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. David lived in a time of, of great difficulty in his own personal life. He was being hunted down. He had to live almost in exile in caves. And um, he, was, <laughs> he, was, he was a challenge to the, to the government of that day. And he had to find ways to survive. And in the midst of that, his only hope was not power. It was not strength. It was not prestige. He, his only hope was God. And he went after God to look for direction and to look for wisdom. And he declared that his hope was in God. We need to come to that place again. That's, that's the seed that God does not allow to die. God wants to nurture that. And I believe there's an amazing, um, amazing group of people across the world, probably numbering in the millions, who desire to hear God and to work together to create vast change. So we're moving in that direction. I want to use an, an example from The Hunger Games. Some of you have watched the movies or read the books in The Humber, Hunger Games a number of years ago. And I found it fascinating, the whole role of hope in those movies. Um, if you've uh, watched the movie, you'll remember President Snow, who was an oppressor. He was, he was, the, he was the guy lording it over and, um, and oppressing the people. And he asks a, a person called the Game Maker why he thinks there's a winner. And he answers his own question. He says this, why do I believe there's a winner? Hope. It's the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. And he means effective to keep control of the people. A lot of hope is dangerous. If you give them too much hope, they're going to think they can actually do something to change their situation. A spark is fine as long as it's contained. I want to reach out to you through this podcast and suggest that we want to start with a spark and we want to fan it into a movement of hope, a movement that has reckless faith, reckless not in the sense that uh, it's irresponsible, but reckless in the sense that, hey, we want to believe what we've never dared or allowed ourselves to believe before, and we want to trust in a God who is not content with the world the way it is. He's not content with your neighborhood the way it is. And he may not be content with the way your heart is right now. The movement starts inside of us and it spreads. We believe that it's time to allow that to happen, but we need to understand this role of hope. So I want to end today with a, a bit of a going back over those six stages and just um, give you a little bit of a hint at what we're looking at in the future. For those who have hope, that first stage when um, it's beautiful, it's full, it's complete, it's wholesome, 
and people who haven't given up hope or have come back to hope because of their walk with God, we want to help make that more contagious because those sparks of hope are what need to spread. Hope doesn't come out of nothing. Hope comes out of the heart of God putting ideas and thoughts and, uh, and wonderful things in our hearts and then it spreads to other people. We want to fan those flames of hope that exist in the lives of many people still. The second stage is frustration. For those who are frustrated, we want to provide tools to address their frustrations, the things that may be making it more difficult to actually to, to, to think about how to create change in the world. And we want to help them return to that vitality and that excitement that, hey, yes, let's do this again. Let's try again because the frustration can be dealt with. For people at the, the despair stage, uh, a, a scary point when if you go much farther, as I explained earlier, you could it could be the point of no return. Uh, we want to catch people at that despair stage and, and inspire them through stories, showing them the lives of others and the, the hope that exists in others and how, where that hope came from and how that hope has led to action that has changed community. So we can use stories to help people who are in despair take note, turn around and say, okay, I feel something growing in me again. The fourth stage Fifth and sixth, resignation, complacency, and detachment. Those are difficult, and in some cases, those people will never come back. But we want to uh, believe that some of them can. There's a verse uh, that I've been reading in um, Ezekiel uh, that says this. This is Ezekiel 36, verses 26. I will give you a new heart. This is God speaking. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Imagine people that are resigned, complacent and detached with a heart of stone. It's like it's died. And yet God, the creator, can bring it to life again. And so we pray for a work of the Holy Spirit. We pray for a work in the hearts of those people that they would start to come to life again. Some of them will, and some of them won't. But God can choose those he will. So our second series, um, after we finish the one we've just started, will focus completely on hope and several aspects of this whole journey toward hope and what we can do as a movement to create hope as a basis for the movement. So we encourage you to listen through for the next few episodes uh, in this section. Uh, The next one will be addressing the problem of ideas. Tune in for that one. Thank you.